Hello, my name is Bob Ader. I'm a professional dowser. We're going to show you how that you can find water and also buried treasure. Dowsing is a very interesting hobby and it can even be a profession. In the 1970s, I became interested in dowsing and became involved with the American Society of Dowsers, attended a chapter meeting in Portland, Maine. After that time, I just did nothing but dows. I learned how to uh, find all kinds of things and have been doing this for 20 years. I have before me some instruments, a few of the different kinds of things that you use to dows for water or for buried treasure. And during this tape, we're going to examine all the different ways that you can find how to uh, put a well in the ground for water, or you can maybe get rich by finding treasure. Of course, there's the old-fashioned stick that we call the Y rod. This is made a little differently than what you're used to seeing. Uh, this is the Egyptian type, the type that the Egyptians used. And this is made out of a flexible material. And we find something by scanning with this. Then we have the L rod, which is a piece of metal or wire. Uh, sometimes it has a little handle on it like this so that it will point at whatever we're trying to find. Sometimes we use two of these. And we just let the rod point in the direction that we want to find something. These can be made out of almost anything. They can be made out of coat hangers. In fact, coat hangers themselves can be used as dowsing rods. And these can be cut so that uh, we have one just like this, and that will work very well. We can go a little further and put a little handle on it and let that be a dowsing rod. Uh, you can use a straight wand. Usually uh, one of these is uh, just simply a stick off a tree, which is very flexible, and you can search for something with that. And when it gets off in the right direction, pointing in the right direction, it will wiggle up and down. And then, of course, you have the classic pendulum, which is any kind of a little weight attached to a string. And you can put anything on there, anywhere uh, from a um, safety pin uh, to a little rubber ball, like I found in the store. Or you can just use a bead chain. That will work very well. And there are just so many different ways that you can douse for water and for treasure. <clears throat> you can actually use your hands. You don't even need any of these instruments. Or you can just use your mind. I call it the mind compass, where your mind just can, uh, tunes into the thing you're looking for and sends you off in a certain direction. And then, of course, we have maps. We can find things on maps. And this special map is a map of New Mexico, and it shows the mountains and the rivers and so forth. And we can actually use a map like this to find treasure or even water. So you'll find that there are all kinds of ways to douse, and we're going to show you all of these ways, and we hope that you'll enjoy these tapes and become a good dowser yourself. Many thousands of years ago, when mankind was wondering where he came from and what his reason for being on earth was, he started to look around him in nature. And he decided that there were powers greater than he. The ancient Egyptians, many, many thousands of years ago, looked at the lotus blossom floating on the water and the sunrise and the sunset. And they were amazed how that their own lives compared with these natural phenomenon. They established a religion which taught that on the day that the earth was born, or that the sun was born, the lotus blossom was its cradle. And this was kind of a magic thing with them. It was a very religious thing. It was a feeling of awe. And so the lotus blossom floating on the water became a symbol of creation.
the lotus had a green part which came down from the blossom which they call the calyx and this is very important because the art of dowsing started way back thousands and thousands of years ago and our devices that we use today for dowsing originated from the lotus one of them comes up like this and then our fork stick originated from the uh, joining of two lotus plants tied uh, with a knot near the top and this was a symbol called a symbol of nascent life or creation beginning and this is where the dowsing rod got its start many thousands and thousands of years ago <clears throat> here we have the ancient symbol that is found in Egypt called the saw wand and this is actually the, the origin of our fork stick dowsing rod. We have two lotus plants tied together with a knot. This symbol is found on monuments that are 4,500 years old. Here we see other variations of the same thing. This is the lotus blossom here in a, in a very stylized fashion. And then we have even a later uh, figure 3,500 years ago uh, we can see the lotus blossom and the tie, the knot. <clears throat> then we have over here a little later, we find what we call the ankh, which is a symbol of life. The ancient belief is that water is the mother of life. You just don't have life unless you have water. And it was tied in with the idea of water and life. So that's why we use this symbol. And then it became a symbol used by the Coptic Christians in Egypt. And see, we have the cross, which is a Christian kind of a cross, uh, with the top carried over from all of this. And then we have other forms of these that are found even at other, other dates. And then just the simple two sticks tied together with a knot. <clears throat> in the mountains, the Atlas Mountains of North Africa, French archaeologists found paintings in caves and this is one of the figures that they found a person standing with two cross sticks this was carbon dated to be about 6,000 years old here we have the same type of thing in Egypt and here we have our modern forked dowsing rod which is the same thing so we see that this all originated a long long time ago Again, we find the lotus is being used in architecture from very, very ancient times right up into the modern times. We can see it in these pillar caps. The round part here is represented by this. And here we see the actual lotus with the flower and the two calyxes. This is found in Solomon's Temple. It's found in all kinds of modern buildings all around the world. <clears throat> The dowsing rod that generated from this symbol was called the litus, L-I-T-U-U-S, and it was used in ancient times to divine information and find directions. Here is one that was made out of a piece of flat brass. It was quite a bit bigger than this, but it was a very sacred instrument, and it wiggled when it gave an answer to uh, a dowsing question. <clears throat> the Egyptians used a long rod like this, and uh, this was probably about three or four feet long, and they would ask questions of their subconscious mind and expect the rod to wiggle, uh, making a yes answer. And here we see how important this curve in the lotus is. These eventually became religious symbols of the bishops of Christianity. Some of them became very ornate. So it was a very sacred symbol. Today we use this same type of a thing with just a handle and a piece of wire. Sometimes we make little uh, designs in the end or put a ball on the end, or we can just use a flexible uh, stick that we cut off of a tree. We douse with this, we can find directions, 
or we can ask yes and no questions. <clears throat> this is an ancient drawing of some dowsers at work uh, that was found in a book published in 1580. <clears throat> and we can see the dowser holding the fork stick in his hand. And uh, here we find one who is cutting a branch to make a fork stick uh, to find this gold or whatever mineral that they're looking for. Here's one who is walking along the hillside expecting a downward reaction uh, when he finds what he's looking for. This is a picture of a North African moor. You can see he has a saw wand in his hair. Some of the European dowsers have been known to wear their dowsing rods and their hat bands in this same manner. So I'm sure that this is a dowser. This artifact was found in a park in England and it is a representation of Alfred the Great, who was King of England from 844 to 899, about a thousand years ago. And I am sure that this was the end of one of his dowsing rods. This is a jewel here. This is made out of a jewel. And you can see this dowsing rod that he is holding in his hand, and he has a jewel down at the end. And this inscription along the edges says that Alfred made me. This was his personal dowsing rod, or the tip of it. And this was about a thousand years ago. We've been following the development of the dowsing rod and dowsers up through history. We haven't covered all of history, of course. But finally we come to Henry Gross who was one of the great dowsers of this century. The American Society of Dowsers was, in, was organized in the 1970s, and Kenneth Roberts uh, from Maine, who was a noted writer, wrote three books on Henry. And this is Kenneth Roberts at his home in Kennebunkport, Maine. This is Henry with his dowsing rod. Henry was a game warden in the state of Maine who became interested in dowsing and he and Roberts organized a company called Water Unlimited and they map doused and uh, doused on site water locations all over the world and here we have Henry uh, with one of the first presidents of the American Society of Dowsers George Plimpton and this picture was taken at one of the conventions in Danville, Vermont, where Henry had doused the location of a well, and a backhoe had been brought in and water was produced. Uh, the three books that Henry was featured in was Henry Gross and His Dowsing Rod, Water Unlimited, and The Seventh Sense. Now these are all out of print, but they can be found in, in used bookstores. If you're really interested in dowsing, especially water dowsing, you should try to get a hold of these books. To be a good water dowser, a person really should have a working understanding of groundwater and how it occurs in the ground. Here we have a chart showing uh, the metoric water system. It shows how the rain comes down and the snow comes down and it melts and finally gets into the ground. Uh, there is another kind of water called conate water. Conate water is water that has been in the ground for thousands and even millions of years. It's the residue of ancient oceans and ancient seas. And uh, this also uh, gets into the groundwater that we find for our well systems. We don't hear much about that. We usually hear about groundwater being a continuous situation under the earth where we have kind of a water table situation. <clears throat> and there are many situations in the ground where the water table theory uh, doesn't hold up. 
We have also another kind of water, a third kind of water, which is called juvenile water or original water. This is actually created chemically in the earth through the natural chemical processes. And so down in the earth, we have three kinds of water. We have that which comes from the rain and snow. We have that that is ancient water that's been here for a long time. And then in some cases, we have water that is manufactured in the earth by chemical process. Uh, geologists tell us that the juvenile water is usually uh, very highly mineralized, uh, but we're not always sure that uh, we know everything about this. So this is what you'll understand if you understand about groundwater. When dowsers try to find water in the ground, which is suitable for a well, they look for a vein of water, or just a little stream or a rivulet of water, which is running through the rocks or through the sand or through the gravel, uh, down at some depth below the surface of the ground. And quite often these little riverlets cross each other at different depths, and if you put a well at a spot where these streams cross each other, then you can get water from several different sources from different directions. I have here some pictures that were taken along a highway in the state of Maine in the spring after the water had been coming out of the rock surface uh, of the face of this escarpment, and it had been freezing as it came down. And you can see that there are different amounts of water coming out at different places along the edge of the road. Here there was a lot of water coming at this depth. Up here there was just a trickle. And all along here we see uh, quite a bit of water coming out and over here we see very little. So if we were walking along the top of this ridge uh, looking for a place to put a well and we got a reaction right over this, we would get down to this depth and we'd find our water. If we were walking along and we got a reaction here and we drilled down, we'd find our water here, but we wouldn't find very much of it. So one of the things a dowser has to learn to do if he's going to find water is to learn how to differentiate uh, between the good water and the bad water, the plentiful water and the scarce water. Here we have another cut along a road showing uh, the bare rocks, and some of these places have uh, rusty iron content in the rock. And you can see where uh, this is a very rusty area here, and over here you have no rust. So if we were walking along the ground surface here and dowsing, and we got a reaction for a well here, we would have rusty water. If we got a reaction here, which would be very unlikely, we'd get nothing. So we have to sometimes differentiate between uh, a place that is going to give us good water or poor water. There are some groundwater situations where uh, water or an aquifer will cover a large area so that you would be permitted to drill almost anywhere in that area or dig in that area and find uh, a lot of water, enough for a well. Uh, these uh, areas could cover even miles at, uh, sometimes, but generally Dowsers look for veins, and almost everywhere in the world you will find these vein situations. Dowsers need to be aware that there are uh, quite often and most often different levels of water, and there are different types of pressure that this water is under. Sometimes the water makes its own pressure by uh, coming from a higher source. Other times there are other pressures in the earth which push the water along. And here we see uh, different veins at different depths, different strengths. Uh, some are wide, some are deep, uh, some are thin, some just uh, become non-existent as they go along. Here we have an illustration of an aquifer uh, which is at a high elevation. And the pressure from the water that is in the aquifer is pushing down through the cracks in the subsurface. And we see that uh, it is not only pushing downward, but it is giving enough force so that it also pushes upward 
uh, through the fissures and through the cracks, and it may even pop out on the ground uh, surface as a spring. But the pressure is coming by the, from the water that is at a higher level. In this illustration, we see that we have a highly pressurized aquifer. In other words, at some depth below the surface of the ground, there's a lot of water in the rock, in the substructure, and this is being forced along either by uh, water that comes from many miles away that has a lot of pressure behind it, or it is even pressured by the gravity itself pushing down on the aquifer. And just as toothpaste comes from a tube, as you squeeze it, the water will squeeze up through the cracks and through the fissures and uh, find paths of least resistance. And in some situations, in some high mountains and hills, uh, we may even find a dome structure where we have uh, part of the hill has been eaten away uh, because of uh, water or different situations, and the water will pressure right up uh, to the top or it may break off into many veins going in different directions, or it may end up as a spring on the ground. So we see that there are many things that can put pressure on the water that is in the earth. Uh, some underground water travels for hundreds of miles, and the pressure might just be from the water itself, or it could be from uh, the simple thing of gravity pushing down on the aquifer. There are many different types of aquifers, aquifers, as I said, and there are many types of pressure. Uh, when a well is drilled through the earth into the aquifer, we find that this pressure that is in the aquifer reacts to the pressure that is coming down from the atmosphere. And the water will rise in the well as the balance occurs. The pressure that comes from here and the pressure that comes from there will determine what the what the height of the water is here. Here we have a situation where we have a very highly pressured aquifer. And it's so highly pressured that it overcomes the atmospheric pressure and actually flows out in onto the ground. And sometimes this will even make a geyser. It will go so high until this pressure is relieved. If it isn't relieved, uh, it'll just keep flowing high. Uh, a dowser can sometimes find a highly pressured aquifer like this uh, that will help to establish a lake or a pond over that aquifer. Or they can find one that will put enough pressure into the pipe that runs from the well uh, to the house or wherever it needs to go uh, so it will be free flowing and it won't even need a pump. Uh, Sometimes if the party that's doing the dowsing feels that there is a lot of pressure there, and this can happen if you're dowsing, uh, you get certain feelings not only from the dowsing device, but you just have a, a knowing uh, that there's just a lot of pressure here. Uh, you could get a backhoe in there or a bulldozer and scrape off a low place, a pond, and then drill down and let the pond fill up. There are just all kinds of things that you can do, and especially if you understand uh, groundwater and how these veins and pressurized aquifers work, uh, you can really engineer a lot of wonderful things. The first thing I do when I teach a new student how to douse is to how to use the L rods. These are made out of a piece of coat hanger with a handle made out of a piece of tubing. And the easiest way to start using these L rods is to find the Earth's magnetic grid system. There is energy which arises from the heart of the Earth and goes on into space. And this energy makes a line from the North Pole to the South Pole. It also goes around the Earth in an east-west direction. The whole Earth is covered with a grid of these lines. So if you want to find these lines by dowsing, uh, you hold your dowsing rods in both hands and you walk across the line. If you want to find a north-south running line, 
you start either we uh, west or east and when you walk forward your hands will be over the line the rods will move outward like this or they will move inward like that I have set up a grid in back of us with string and I'm going to show you how this works These lines can be found all over the face of the earth, right in your own backyard or wherever you are at the time. So if you want to learn how to douse with the L rods, I suggest that you go into your yard and walk either east or west or north or south and see what kind of a reaction you get. And you'll find that this is a very interesting uh, way to, to start learning dowsing. If you don't have a set of L rods, you can just simply get a set of coat hangers from your closet and they make wonderful dowsing rods. You hold them loosely in your fingers like this so that they're balanced in front of you and you will either get an inward response like that or you get an outward response like this. And I'm going to go over the grids that we have already found and marked on the ground and show you how these work. That's very simple, it's a lot of fun, everybody can do it. This is a classic dowsing rod, which we call the Y rod or the fork stick. This has been made out of a piece of spline with a little bead put on the end. And it is the type of dowsing rod that the ancient Egyptians used. Today we're used to seeing a dowser walk across a field with a fork stick cut from a tree. But these are so easy to make and carry around that sometimes I don't use that uh, fork stick. But if you want to, you can also use a fork stick to find these grid lines. When you're using a Y rod, you start this way. And you put your hands around it and you spread it so that you have unstable equi equilibrium. You have an unstable situation. Now if we're going to find these grid lines with this, we walk over the prospective lines and when we're over one, the rod will dip like this. Uh, the word douse means to lower, strike, or fall. And so when the dowsing rod is lowering or falling, that means it's dowsing. Now I'd just like to say a thing about um, the position that this dowsing rod is held in. There are a, a lot of different ways that it can be held. This is a standard way that I like, but you can start down here and hold it this way, 
or pointed up just a little or straight up. Either one of those three positions will work. Or you can hold it out in front of yourself in the same way, like this, like this, or like this. And we found that many people who don't seem to be able to get a reaction with any of these positions will get a reaction if they place it up over their head and use it like this, or like this, or like this. So whatever position will work for you is the one that you should use. You can find grid lines with this, or you can find water veins, or you can find just about whatever you're looking for. Now that you've learned how to find the Earth's magnetic grid lines, the next step is to learn how to find a water vein in the ground. Instead of imagining in your mind electricity or energy coming from the Earth, we're going to imagine a little stream of water down below us, below the ground surface. You hold your dowsing rod in this position, just like I taught you before, and you scan the whole area around you. And when the rod is pointing in the direction that you might find a water vein, it will say yes. So we're asking questions of our subconscious mind. A no response would mean that you'd get no response whatsoever. And a yes response would mean that you'd get a reaction from the dowsing rod. So in that direction, there is a water vein. There. <clears throat> now I'm going to walk around that spot in a circle and define the water vein. Here's the center of it. Here it is here. Here it is here. So we see this running. Now, if I wanted to put a well on that water vein, dig a hole so we could have a well, I would ask my subconscious to tell me the best place to put it. 